So continuing with our review on math, this lecture will be on waves. So our wave equation for a wave, a transverse wave, traveling down the x-axis has this form right here. The second derivative of y with respect to x squared is equal to 1 over the velocity squared, partial squared, of y with respect to t squared. This right here is a wave traveling down the x direction at a velocity v, and y is what's going up and down. Now if it's just a string, you're shaking a string and it's going up and down, y would just be the y position of the string. If it's a water wave, y would just be the position. If we're talking about a light wave, the y's would be the electric fields and the magnetic fields. So this is, this is just for any transverse wave. And the solution to this wave, y, which is a function of x and t, is equal to a cosine kx minus omega t. This is a, a wave traveling to the right. If this was a plus, it would have been a wave traveling to the left. But this is a, a wave traveling to the right. Now just to see what happens when we plug this up into here. Well, if we take the derivative, the partial derivative of this with respect to x, right here, the second derivative. Well, we're going to be taking the second derivative of the cosine. Well, the second derivative of the cosine gives you the cosine back, but minus. And every time I take the derivative, I'm going to get a k squared. So this thing is going to end up being a minus a k squared back to exactly what I had before. a cosine kx minus omega t. So there is the left side. The right-hand side is we've got 1 all over the velocity squared. And now we're going to take the second derivative of this with respect to time. Well, the second derivative of, the again, the cosine would just give me back a minus cosine. And then every time I take a derivative, I'm going to get a minus omega out here. So I'm going to get minus omega, another minus omega, and another minus from the cosine. So it's going to end up being a minus. I get, pull out the omega squared, and I'm back to the same thing again. A cosine kx minus omega t. Okay, well I can cancel out the a cosine omega t's, a cosine omega t's, and cancel out the two minuses, and we get, oh this was k squared, because we brought out k twice. I can solve for the velocity right here. The velocity, bring the velocity up here, take the k down below, we get velocity squared equals omega squared over k squared, or velocity. We call this the phase velocity. It's the, it's the speed that the crest is moving. So I'm going to put a little phase in here. And that's equal to omega over k. So when you look at this wave right here, it looks like the speed is everything in front of the t divided by what's in front of the x right here. So if I get a different color, I just wanted to mark that now. So whenever you see something like this, the speed is always this divided by that. Okay, now I can't I can't draw this I can't draw this wave right here. It's a movie right here. I have to draw it, then erase it, draw it again, erase it, draw it again because it's changing with time. But what I could do is I could draw it at a specific time. Let's just draw it at t equals zero. That I can do. So we'll just say what is y of x zero. Well, that means this is gone and we just get a cosine kx. That I can draw. That we know, it just kind of goes like this. 
where since it's the cosine, I guess that's the origin right there. It's just a nice cosine wave, and we know that the wavelength is the distance from here to where it repeats itself. Well, we know when x is equal to the wavelength, that means that this has gone through 2 pi. We've gone through one complete cycle of the cosine. So we can set k wavelength equal to 2 pi. Or k equals k equals 2 pi over the wavelength. 2 pi all over the wavelength. And we call this the wave number. Wave number. Okay, so the bigger the wavelength, the smaller the k. The smaller the wavelength, the bigger the k. Okay, uh, if I wanted to, instead here I drew it at t equals zero. But I could also draw it if, if I just wanted to find out what did the time do, I could just say, let's just draw it at x equals zero. So what's y of zero t going to look like? Well, then I'm just going to sit here going up and down, because I'm not going, I'm always plotting it at t equals zero. So this, this thing right here, I don't know how to plot it right here, but it would just kind of go up and down right here. And the function would have looked like this with x equal to 0, because I'm plotting it out at x equals 0. So, so y of 0, t, is equal to just a cosine of minus omega t. I can take out the minus, because the cosine of a minus is the same as the cosine of a plus. So I can just say it's a cosine omega t. Well, I know that every time it started up here, and it went down and came back up. By the time it came back to the same spot, we call that the period. I use this fancy T for the period right there. And so we can say when the T is the period, that this thing has gone through 2 pi. So we can say omega period equals 2 pi. Or the period, uh, well, we can just... We can just say omega is 2 pi over the period. Or 1 over the period is the frequency. This is 2 pi times the frequency. So when we said the phase speed, it's the speed that this point is actually moving. If we just divide, we know what k is and we know what omega is. This is omega, which is... 2 pi times the frequency times divided by k, and k is 2 pi over the wavelength. The 2 pi's drop out, and we can see that the speed is the frequency times the wavelength. Remember, that's what we said it was for light. This is the true for any transverse wave. Okay, so just to give us some, a little bit on the waves right here. So now, what happens when we have multiple waves right here? Multiple sound waves, multiple light waves, put them all together. We have something called the principle of superposition, which says the total Y is just the sum of all the individual Ys. All the, all the waves, the total wave is just the sum of all the individual waves. That's, this is called the principle of superposition. Principle of superposition. Okay, and that's, and you noticed here, since some waves can be positive and some waves can be negative, we get interference because when you add positive and negative things, you can end up with zero. Remember, with particles, you never get a negative. It's always positive. Okay, well, let's say we have just two waves. Let's just make it simple. We just have two waves. Let's say we have y1 of x and t is equal to a cosine 
K1 X minus omega 1 T. And let's say we've got another way right here, which is psi 2 Y2 of X and T. And that's equal to, oh, we'll give it the same amplitude, but it's just different K, K2, different wavelength, X minus a different omega 2 T. Okay, we've got these two waves, and I'm going to assume that K1 and K2 are close. They're not equal. K1 is approximately K2. A little off right here. Same with omega. Omega 1 is a pr pretty close, but not equal to omega 2. They're close to each other. Okay, so now we've got two waves. Now we listen, or whatever they are, these two waves, we combine the two of them together. And what do we get? Well, y total would just be the sum of these two, which would just be, I can factor out the a, and we would have the cosine k1x minus omega 1t. Uh, we're just adding them, plus cosine k2x minus omega 2t. So that's the sum of the two waves. But I think I can write this a little bit better because there's a trig identity. It's called a sum to product rule. It says that the cosine of A plus the cosine of B is 2 cosine B minus A all over 2 times the cosine B plus A, A all over 2. Okay, this is just a sum to product rule. So you notice comparing with what, up we, have, what we have up here, this is my A and this is my B. So now I can just use this rule right here. So using, using the rule I have right here, we get y total is equal to, well, we're going to get 2a, and then we get the cosine of this minus this, right here, the cosine of this minus this, so we get K2X minus omega 2T. K2X minus omega 2T minus the other one. K1X minus omega 1T. And uh, we've got all over 2. And then we have the other cosine, the cosine over here, which would just be the same, except this would be a plus right there. So we get the cosine of K, K2x minus omega 2t plus K1x. minus omega 1t, all over 2. Okay, now what I think I'm going to do is 2a. I'm going to break, combine these two terms together, put the k's together and the x's, and put the omegas and the t's together. So we get the cosine. So over here, I'm going to get K1 minus K2 minus K1. Factor the K's out times X. And that's all over 2. And then we have minus. And since I factored out the minus here, this would be a plus omega 2. 
minus, because this was a, a plus, and I want to pull down a minus, so it's going to be a minus omega 1 t all over 2. Okay, and then times this term over here. We'll do the same thing. The only difference is now it's going to be k2 plus k1. k2 plus k1x all over 2 minus omega 2 plus omega 1 t all over 2. Okay, well, k2 minus k1, k2 minus k1, that's just the difference, the, the change in k, the difference in k. We'll just write it like this. Same with omega 2 minus omega it's just the difference in omega. Over here, k2 plus k1 all over 2. Well, that's just the average. The way you get the average, you add them up and divide by 2. So this is the average k. k average. And this last term, omega 2 plus omega 1 all over 2 is equal to omega average. Okay, so now let me put those in place. So this y total is equal to 2a cosine. This would have been delta k over 2 x minus delta omega over 2 t. And then the second term would have been cosine k average x minus omega average t. Okay. Made it look a little bit, a little bit less right here. Now, if I wanted to draw this out, again, I have a time in there. So I'm going to have to pick a certain time and then plot it. Well, t equals zero is good, so we'll just plot this y total. This is at, at t equals zero. t equals zero. And this is 2a. Uh, cosine. Now this is gone and that's gone. So we just get delta k over 2x cosine k average x. k average x. Okay. So now we can plot this out. How do we plot this out? Well, first of all, we said k2 and k1 were pretty close. So that means k1 and k2 are pretty close, then the difference is a pretty small number. So this number is, is small, small, and this is the average, so this is up there near, this, so this is going to be much bigger than that, let's we'll just call it big. Well, remember, the bigger the k is, the smaller the wavelength. Because remember, k is 2 pi over the wavelength. If k is small, the wavelength is big. If I were to just plot this part, just this right here, again, that's going to have a big wavelength. So it's going to look something like, like this. Big wavelength. Whereas, so that's, that's this term right here. This is this term. If we plot it out the other term, this term right here, this would have, it's a k is big, so that means the wavelength is small. And so that's going to look like Like this. Okay. 
So now what do we want to do? We want to take the product of these two. Well, what is the product of these two blue and this red curve going to give me? Well, it's going to give me the blue curve, but the amplitude will be the red curve. So I guess I'll better draw it on another plot right here. So if we were to draw that, it would look more like This is my amplitude. But it would look like like this. happening here? This thing's getting bigger, smaller, bigger, and smaller. Now, if we were talking about sound right here, what would this sound like right here? If I had two frequencies that were close to each other, these are two frequencies that are kind of close, and if I hit them both, then what we should hear is we should see a wave something like this blue one, but you notice the amplitude's getting bigger and smaller at a much lower frequency. The red frequency is much lower. Well, I happen to have a tuning fork right here. Two tuning forks, and I've adjusted, they're just slightly different with this little piece added on. If I were to hit just the one here, That would just be one of them. That would be a wave similar to this blue one right here. If I hit just the other one, that would be one just like the blue, but slightly different because they're slightly off right here. But now if I hit them both, vibration. So you're hearing, these are called the beat frequencies. So, so you get it just from putting together waves. Now, you notice, the reason why we're bringing up waves is because, didn't we say the electron is actually a wave? Right? And so, so where is my electron? If I wanted to define, you know, we just have an electron here. Is really a wave. Well, we could just say, at least for now, that maybe this, forget about all the rest of them, this kind of is my, my electron. It kind of looks like, like that. There's my electron's wave. And <clears throat> uh, we can say that the electron is somewhere within this. The bigger the wave is, we can say, he's more likely to be right there. He's less likely to be out here, more likely to be right there. Well, that would mean that I know the electron is somewhere between here and here. Remember, we're not worried about these other bumps. We'll figure out how to get rid of those right here. We're just looking at one. I usually call this the blob right here. Usually the more technical term is the group right there. But uh, this, this Right here, this uh, blob right here, the uncertainty in where he's at is actually somewhere between here and here. We can say the uncertainty, we're going to use the little delta x, the uncertainty. In position, we can say he's somewhere within this range right here. Well, if we look at this, you'll notice from this cosine, since this is a half a wave, this is 2 pi all the way to here. From here to here is 2 pi. From here to here is only pi. So I can set when x is equal to delta x, 
set this equal to pi. So that means we got delta k over 2, sorry, delta k over 2, times, times delta x is equal to pi, because that's the phase, that's how much you've gone through when you went to read your pi. So that means delta k, delta x, equals 2 pi. Which says that the smaller I make these two closer together, the closer I make the k's to each other, the bigger the x's get. This gets wider and wider when I make the k's closer and closer together. If I make the k's... Uh, so again, if I make the k's closer, the delta y's get bigger. Or if I make the, if I wanted to make this smaller, I'm going to need a bigger spread in k's. Now remember, we said for high, uh, for de Broglie wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength lambda was equal to h over p. That was our de Broglie wavelength, or our p was equal to h over the wavelength. Well, if we take and put a 2 pi here and divide it by a 2 pi, we notice that that right there is h bar, and this over here was k. So this is k h bar. So k is like a momentum right here. k is like just the matter, it's just times a constant. So whenever you think about k in quantum mechanics, think about the momentum of the particle. Well, that would mean that if I just, the uncertainty in P is equal to the uncertainty in K, H bar. So if I just multiply both sides by H bar, H bar, and H bar, this is my uncertainty in the momentum. So I have the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position and that equals 2 pi h bar. But h bar was h over 2 pi. The 2 pi's drop out, and so this is h. So this is the best you can ever do whenever you're trying for your uncertainty. You can never get less uncertain. You can get more uncertain than this, but you can never get less uncertain. So really, we should say this is greater than or equal to. This is one of Heisenberg's uncertainty principles. It says you can't know the momentum and the position of an of a per electron or any particle exactly. And the more you try to pin it down where it is, the less you're going to know its momentum, or the more you try to pin its momentum down, the less you're going to know where he's at. So. So that means that, you know, if you put an electron in a box, right here, an electron in there in the box, you're already pinning him down by his position. You know he's in the box, so there's your delta x. So you can't know his momentum exactly of an electron in the box, because if you knew this exactly, it'd be zero right here. And zero times the size of the box is, is definitely doesn't fit this. It's, it's uh, smaller than H right here. So, so an electron could never just sit still in a box. That's impossible. Now, you'll notice right here, we have two different cosine functions, which means we have two different speeds. We have the, the speed of the blue wave here, which was our phase speed, this blue wave which is due to this term right here, which is, what did we say? It was everything over here divided by that. So the V, the phase, is just equal to omega average over K average. Omega average over K average. Remember, we said it was omega over K before, but that was just one way. So now it's just the average. And we also have another one here too, the red wave. And the red wave, that's also a cosine function, and that's also moving. 
I don't know where to draw it right here, but we'll just draw it right there. The red wave, we could call that the blob speed. That would be the speed that the blob is moving, but they usually call that the group speed. V of the group. And that would be this. Oh, sorry, everything in front of the T divided by everything in front of the X again. Well, if I take this and divide it by that, the twos are gone, and it's just delta omega all over delta K. Or, since we really want to get close, we could just say it's d omega dk, or just d omega dk. So this is V of the group right here. Now, this will be actually the speed of the electron. The electron is the blob right here, and its movement would be the speed of the group. Now, you notice, just like we had a relationship between delta, delta K and X, we had an uncertainty right there, we also get one, uh, if we were to plot this at a particular time, sorry, at a particular X, let's say X equals zero. If I were to plot this, just like we did before, plot it at X equals zero, this would be gone and that would be gone. I could get rid of the minuses because cosine of a minus is the same as cosine of a plus. And so I could have just said, say, y total at, t, at x equals zero. That would just be 2a cosine delta omega over 2t times the cosine of omega average t. Okay, and so we can see this one's the one that's related to the blob right here. And we know from here to here, you're going through, normally this is a whole period right here. And so I could say, delta omega, just like we did before, times delta t, put this over 2, equals pi, because when you go from here to here, you're going through pi, even in time, we're going through pi. So we get delta omega delta t equals 2 pi, or, remember we said e was equal to hf. And h was equal to 2 pi h bar, and f was omega over 2 pi. The 2 pi's drop out, so e is h bar omega. So delta e, uncertainty in the energy, is h bar times the uncertainty in the omega. So, multiplying both sides by h bar here, h bar and h bar, this just becomes uncertainty in energy times the uncertainty in time. When I say the uncertainty in time, the uncertainty in time is the time to make that measurement. That has got to be equal. At best, it can be as h. But that's the best, so normally it's going to be bigger than or equal to H. So this is another Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I can't know the energy of something exactly unless I have all the time in the universe to measure it. So, so when I think we brought this up before, if I wanted to measure the mass of a particle, E equals mc squared, but it doesn't live very long. Then I can't measure, I can't, it's impossible for me to know the mass of a particle. You know, when they found the, the Higgs boson right here, well, if we just multiply both sides by uh, delta, delta E equals, there's no uncertainty in the speed of light, so uncertainty in the mass, speed of light squared. If I just put that in here, Let's just set it equal. Well, we don't even need to set it equal. We'll keep the greater than or equal to. Here you've got delta m c squared delta t. Delta m 
c squared. And for delta t, I could say, well, maybe that's the half-life, because I can't, that limits me. I can't measure, I only have the time of the half-life to measure. So I'm going to put in the half-life of that delta t. t half-life. That has got to be greater than h. Or the uncertainty in the mass has got to be greater than h all over c squared half-life. So if you have a very short half-life, that means that this is big, then, then your uncertainty in your mass is going to be big right here. A lot of particles live for a very brief instant of time, which means you have big uncertainties in their mass. You'll never get any better than that because it's impossible. So now we have, we actually have three Heisenberg uncertainty principles. We have this one, we have this one, and then we also have that when we had the two slits, we said it's impossible to know which, when we had the double slit, which hole the electron went through and got the interference pattern right there. So that was a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, uh, well, you noticed right here, we have to come back to omega. What did we say? We said omega is equal to the V phase times K. So, we come back to here, so omega equals uh, K times V phase. And then we said the group speed, we have that somewhere over here, we said it was the derivative, the group speed, which is right here. The group speed is the derivative of it. So, we can plug that in, the group speed is equal to the derivative of this with respect to k. Well, if we take the derivative of this with respect to k, what do we got? We got the derivative of the first, which is 1, times the second, which is vp, plus the, the first, k, times the derivative of the second, dvp dk. Okay. So, if we look at something like, let's look at light, light, in a vacuum, in vacuum. Well, this says, does the speed of the light depend on the wavelength? Remember, k is a wavelength. No, all the colors all went at the same speed. Gamma rays, x-rays, they all go at the same speed for light in a vacuum. So this is zero. So that means for light in a vacuum, V group equals V phase, which is the speed of light. But let's say we put this light it's not in a vacuum. Maybe it's going through glass right here. So now we just say light in glass. In glass. Well, the light, different colors go at different speeds in glass. The shorter the wavelength, the slower it goes in glass. Blue goes slower in glass than red does. So this term right here is actually negative. This term, this, this dvp dk is actually less than zero. It's a negative right here, which means if this is a negative quantity, then v group is V of the speed of light. Remember, that's the speed of light minus some stuff. So that means you get V of group equals the C minus some stuff right here. So it's going to go slower. So, so the pulse, if you send in a pulse, put a bunch of waves together and make up a pulse and throw it into glass right here, this pulse will slow down and anytime it slows down, we also get dispersion because this, this is a dispersion term, which means the pulse gets wider right here, too. 
So as a, if you put in a real sh quick pulse as it goes inside, it's going to get wider and wider. It's going to spread out. So this is a this is a term is really due to dispersion. 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 Okay. Well, what about for matter? For electrons, right here. For electrons. Uh, what can we say? We can still come back to, to here. V phase is still omega over k, but an omega is still 2 pi times the frequency. And we know the frequency is energy over h. So this is 2 pi, since we know e equals hf, f is equal to e over h. There. Or E over H bar. This is E over H bar. Since we put the H over the 2 pi. That's what my omega is right here. And we need to know my V, V phase. V phase is omega over K. So it's this over K. So it's E over K H bar. Well, what was E for an electron? E for an electron. He's, I'm assuming he's moving. He's got momentum. We can even use relativity right here. Isn't his E equal to the square root of P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth? I know that, so I'm going to put that in for my, for my E. So this is the square root of P. Now, I'd like to put it in terms of K. Didn't we already say P is equal to KH bar? So for my P, I'm just going to use KH bar. So we got K squared, H bar squared. That's my P squared. C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. divided by kh bar, or v phase is equal to, now I can put this up into that term, and these will drop out, and so I just get the square root of c squared plus this other term here, which is m squared c to the fourth, and then putting the k up there, that's k squared h bar squared. Well, you'll notice that, that this is big is, is a positive number. You can't have a negative. Everything's squared right here. And so this plus c squared, take the square root. This is bigger than c. So first of all, we can see that the phase speed is bigger than the speed of light. Uh, it doesn't mean that the signal is going faster. That means this blue wave, this is the phase speed, this blue wave is going faster than the speed of light. Remember, the particle is the, is the wave, is the red blob speed. Right? So it takes really fast blue waves to make blobs. Okay. Well, that's the, that's the phase speed right here. Now, first of all, you notice the phase speed also is dependent on the wavelength. Remember, when we said light is in a vacuum, this term was zero in v, v phase. Well, actually, let's just, yeah, the V phase didn't depend on K right here when you're in a vacuum. This right here was zero. When you were in a, in a vacuum, then this came out to be a negative term right here. But you'll notice you always get dispersion with an electron right there. For matter waves, you always get dispersion. So if you measure the position of an electron, and all of a sudden his wave is really short like that, you've measured his position, if you don't look at it, he's going to start spreading out all the time right here. So, and this spreading out can be very fast right here. This wave can spread out. doesn't mean the electron spreads out. It means the probably where you're going to find it is spreading out really fast. Okay, now if we wanted to get the group speed, all we have to do is take the derivative of this. And see, the group speed is the derivative of this.
this. So V group, sorry, V group, which we said is the derivative of phase with respect to K. Put that down right here. Sorry, it's uh, sorry, it's d omega dk, omega dk. So it means I have to get omega. Uh, well, we can get omega right here because we said v omega is k times v phase. Omega is equal to v phase times times k, so it's just this times k, so it's just times v phase times k, which is k times the square root of all of this, uh, c squared plus m squared c to the fourth all over k squared h bar squared. And then I could take the derivative of it right here, with respect to k, I guess I'd even push that through. If I push that through, or maybe I should do that, omega is actually equal to the square root of k squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth all over h bar squared. Now I can take the derivative of it, and that's what would be the group. V group, I take the derivative of this with respect to k, I'm just taking the derivative of this with respect to k, so I get one half times all of this, everything inside, to the minus one half times the derivative of what's inside. The derivative of what's inside is 2k c squared. Okay, so it looks like I can get the v group is equal to the twos drop out right here. We get k c squared all over the square root of all this stuff. Well, it's just going to be the square, well, we can see right here, the square root of all this stuff is omega over k. So I can just replace this with omega all over k. And uh, omega over k. Uh, and so this gives me the group speed in the group speed right here this omega over k you know this group speed has to be less than c right here. that's all we care about is this this thing has to be less than c so so this k squared over omega should that have been omega squared it's going to be omega squared right there to make my units work out uh, sorry Okay, right there. So this right here, this right here is my group right here on, on the bottom. So we, I mean our phase, so we get V group equals C squared over V phase. Or bringing this up to top, we get V group times V phase equals the speed of light squared. Which means since this has to be less than the speed of light, that has to be a lot more than the speed of light, because when you take the product, you've got to get the speed of light squared. So what this is saying is that the electrons are always going to be spreading out, and we're going to be putting together a lot of waves to make a blob. That'll be, that's the only way you can make a blob of waves. And just over here on the computer... So what I have here is I put two sine waves. This black wave, you see this black wave right here, and I have another one that's slightly different. I didn't want to show them both right here. But the sum of the two black waves is the red wave. You, you notice you get the blob right here. But now, since they're both traveling right here, if I wanted to see them traveling, this is how they would look traveling down. And what you want to see here is, if I slow it down a little bit, this arrow is pointing down at the phase speed right here. So I have it just above one of these right here. And you notice it's going a lot faster than the blob speed. The blob is moving. You see right here, if I come back, the blob is over here. Now it's moved right here. So, so right here, this is the, it takes a lot of fast moving waves, phase speeds to make a blob speed that's not going very fast. Okay, so I just wanted to show that.